動でお風呂を沸かしますお風呂の線は来ましたか自動でお風呂を沸かしますHello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from four undisclosed locations in the UK. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter Murray, and Anna Tashinsky. And once again, we have gathered round the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Andy. My fact is that for years, scientists thought starfish had no heads. It now turns out they have no bodies. <laughs> wow. All head. Are even the arms heads? No. Yeah. I, I think what, what this shows is that it's actually quite hard to describe starfish in terms of human anatomy. And yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> like, so what's um, the difference between head and body according to this definition? Okay, this is the result of a new study uh, from Stanford University and I think maybe one or two other places. And it's, it's about the genetic code that sort of programs starfish. Because starfish are really, really weird bodily. As in, they start out uh, with bilateral symmetry, which is what humans have. As in, you've got two sides, you've got a left and a right, and it's, you're sort of the same. You know, you're mirrored. So starfish start out like that when they're first born. And then they kind of grow out of it and they become the starfish shape that we know. Um... And so what the study is, it looked at the genetic code which kind of programs head-like territory and it turns out that they have that in each of their arms and so then, and the middle, the middle bit, uh, which joins all the arms together, has more head-like genetics. Not one bit of the starfish contains the genetic program which we associate in, in our own bodies with a trunk or a torso. Are they one entity or are the arms mini heads? Yeah. Okay, so it's not like one big orbiting oh, head. It's, it's a bit like that. Like we used to think it was, imagine your body, mm-hmm. but then we cut off your head, and mm-hmm. so you're just a middle with some arms and legs sticking out. But now what it turns out is, imagine someone took off your arms and legs and superglued them to your head. That's it. That's although I <laughs> read, and I don't know if this was one of the guys involved in the study, a biologist called Thurston Lacalli which is just a really cool name. He said we should be thinking of them as a disembodied head walking about the seafloor on its lips. So I guess oh, yes. he's saying the legs are the lips, lily well, legs. No, well, yeah, kind of, except that also, Dan, in this example, where yeah. we've removed your arms and legs, we've also superglued your anus to the back of your head. Okay. Uh, so, yes, you are walking Dan, around Dan, you're becoming your more too. and more attractive by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> Please, fan art sent to Andy. <laughs> Basically, what the main headline is, is that there's no way for a starfish to sing the song Head, Shoulders, Knees and Toes. Like, there's just no analogy for that. <laughs> that is head, 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 lips, feet. <laughs> anus. Anus. <laughs> anus, head, head, lips and feet. Lips and feet. Amazing. That's incredible. Well, I wonder... Is this why um, they have that feature that I think we must have mentioned before, where even if you cut off the main circular bit that looks like a body to us and just are left with a leg, they can regrow and regenerate their entire self from just a leg? Oh, Maybe yeah. Is that related to the fact that each leg actually has this genetic head material in it that can sprout everything yeah. new? Yeah. But it's, what- it's a cool thing to be able to do anyway. Imagine there someone is- just cutting all of your body off except your finger and then your finger grew a whole new body on it. It's mental. It's absolutely crackers. The regeneration thing uh, is insane because as you say, like a tiniest bit can be chopped off and they can grow into a whole new starfish and that's really messed up a lot of fishermen back in the day. So there's areas of the world where they would eat the local oyster population uh this is the starfish and they were depleting it so what fishermen used to do is when they got a starfish out they'd kill it and they'd kill it by slashing it into two or five or whatever and then just chucking (laughs) them back into the ocean not realizing they were creating a giant army of starfish like what i imagine the gremlins were if i ever watched that movie is that what happens you put water on them and they all double into well, is that what that happens? Is... Do they multiply? I can't remember. I haven't seen oh, it. Guys, what are you? What are you? Yeah, of course, Dan. I'm really disappointed in you. Sorry. Do the gremlins get chopped up into smaller pieces and then Look, create more gremlins? If you put water on them, yeah. they multiply. If you feed them after midnight, they become evil. If you expose them to sunlight, they die. 
How many anuses yeah. do they have? Uh, that is very vexed doctrine. Um, there is a big debate among us gremlin heads. Yeah. <laughs> There's an amazing thing that they do as well when they're eating. Um, starfish will basically send their stomach to go and get the meal. So say if they're eating something, like there's a there's a thing called the sand dollar, um, which is quite a flat little uh, species, and it you find it on the on the floor of the ocean. They'll send their stomach out. They'll they'll surround it, and they'll yeah. melt down the body of it into the food, bring it back in, and just leave the skeleton. You know what? If we did that, then probably the job of delivery driver would be quite bad. <laughs> Well, the, the deli my delivery rude drivers don't stick around and watch me eat my meal. Yeah, but you really? have to because instead of you coming to the door, your stomach would come to the door. And when they handed you the food, your stomach would kind of envelop around the bag of Chinese takeaway. <laughs> Leaving only the plastic Tupperware behind. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can't believe yours don't watch you eat, Anna. It's, um, maybe I'm tipping generously enough yeah, that they I'm do. But they always, they always stick they? around through the letterbox. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing about this this stomach uh, inside out thing is that you know um, oxytocin they call it the love chemical the love, yeah very important in uh, childbirth it's like what stimulates a lot of changes in the body when you when you have a baby and stuff like that oh but god in, they go on about it don't they they That's don't like, have now got... that we will oh my god light some scented candles play some music oh that'll get your oxytocin going it's literally bollocks, if it? you ever go to one of those things where they teach you how to be a parent if they ask you any question just say oxytocin and that is always the answer <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is but anyway not if you're a starfish if you're a starfish oxytocin makes your stomach go inside out cool so it's in starfish world it's known as the stomach inside out hormone not the love hormone ah. and they go to special lessons don't they about how to eat their first meal and yeah. it's well lighter scented candle difficult underwater but you can do it so that it's good for, as in it's not in a bad way as in it's not bad for them yeah it's good it's the chemical which they release when they're hungry so that it kind yeah. of sets into motion this thing that dan oh, wow. described and so we kind of use it for something different? Yeah, we use it to... To feel love. Yeah, to make changes in the body to help mm. you to procreate. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing the difference in romantic stuff that you two say to your partners. <laughs> Andy says, oh, I love you. And James says, I'm having changes in my body that are helping me to procreate towards you right now. <laughs> oh, well, can we say, can we say what um, some starfish do in, in exactly this? Now we're on their, kind of on their love life. Um, yeah. Have you heard of pseudocopulation? Pseudo Have I? <laughs> <laughs> That's all the copulation I've ever done. <laughs> I'm so glad we've reached like 70s comedian. It actually is quite like that because normally, or loads of species of starfish, obviously there are dozens and dozens, normally they release um, sperm and eggs near each other and uh, they then meet up. And you know, there's no sex as we understand it at all. Mm -hmm. But pseudocopulation is kind of similar. So a male and a female, they form a pair and the male, quite sweet this, puts all his arms between the female's arms so they're kind of cuddled and then she releases eggs right there and he simultaneously releases all his sperm. So it's like a very intense cuddle, basically. Oh, okay. That's yeah. that's nice. Did you say that's how they that's how a particular species does it, sorry? It's how some species do it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not oh, all of them. Do you guys happen to know? I, I I'm only thinking of this because Andy's brought this up, but if you chop a starfish in half and it regenerates into a new starfish, does it carry the same age? Or does it start fresh? Because, you know, they can live up to like 35 years, roughly. I think they can start fresh because for some of them, that's actually how they procreate is just by dividing um, that, even even more sexless. That's what I mean. So, they don't need copulation, really. They just um, lob an arm off and they're, uh, they're good. Well, they don't Sorted. necessarily need it, but it's good for genetic diversity copulation. Mm. That's why I always say to my wife, <laughs> so, this will be good for the genetic diversity of our species, darling. <laughs> oh, Valentine's Day for our canal so. There's some very cool... There are some very cool versions. I think I really like the, the cushion starfish because it's not actually star shaped. If you look at it, it's like it forgot to sprout its lips slash legs. It's just a pentagon, really. And wow. um, when it's young, it starts out as a pentagon and it just gets bigger and bigger. And then it ends up as a big blob like a cushion. Oh, nice. It is quite cool. nice. There's about 2,000 yeah. of them, 2,000 species. And um, it's, we're in dangerous times. So back in episode 45, James mentioned a thing, which was the starfish wasting syndrome, which is this really horrible disease that has just been sweeping through the oceans. And within hours of a starfish getting this disease, 
they are dying and they're dying in really weird ways so as james mentioned one of the arms sort of dislodges itself and just walks off into the distance so they keep finding these these arms everywhere just laying on the seabed and then a completely gooey yucky starfish that's just been you know eaten by this disease and we are losing billions at a time at the moment. It's it's so huge, it's so bad. And as far as I can tell, the leading scientists who are trying to work out what's going on are studying it in a tank. And do you know where this tank is? Uh, it's in Star City. No, it's in... <laughs> it's uh, in um, the Madame Tussauds. It's in the Pentagon, and it's Ooh, got Pentagon nice. starfish in very it. Very nice. Oh, that's lovely. No. Uh, it's on the... I, I, how are we supposed to know that? It's in one of those restaurants give where you clue. go in and they've got all those lobsters, sort of sad-looking lobsters okay. hanging around, and it's in there. It's not that. I'll give you a clue. It's in the Mexican aquarium where Free Willy was based. Oh, that's great. You were basically there. It is literally in a warehouse right behind the place where Keiko was held. Holy where Free shit. Willy was oh, held. Yeah. Oh, really? oh, my God. That was such a good guess. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so they're studying them there, and they've they've found a method which is kind of helping them. But you can't get that into the oceans right now. It's insane. There's nothing it's, we can uh, do. But what's causing it? Is it? Is it? They think it's a, a bacteria. Disease? Is it? Yeah. Right. Okay. They, but they don't actually know. And James mentioned this close to ten years ago, and we're still none it's the wiser. It's ridiculous. What's the point of me bringing these subjects to light? If they're not going to do anything in nine years, mm. <laughs> honestly, yeah. you guys listen back to episode 45, 46, 47. Yeah. I was always bringing up these really important things and everyone just ignored me like Cassandra. Yeah, it's hard to know what to do about it, isn't it? As your everyday man on the street. Maybe they need, we need a free starfish, you know, free What's willy a, sequel. Oh, someone yeah. Wrote. Flinging it into the ocean. I don't know. <laughs> since mm. 2013 five billion have died from this disease and they're down Jeez. population wise by 90 percent it's mad oh my goodness yeah. that's terrible you could also eat starfish can you uh yes some places uh in the far east do uh there's a place called Qingdao where it's quite common that they eat starfish i've seen a blog of people making them and eating them what you do is you kind of break off the leg and then you open it up and then the meat is inside and it looks like if you can imagine a baby's nappy when they've first gone onto solids it looks a bit like that uh why did you get fired as the um restaurant menu description (laughs) writer for this place james i don't know i thought it was a visceral way of describing it (laughs) and apparently the um the taste is the same as a beach smells at low tide Right. Wow. Uh, but yeah, they eat them in Qingdao, but to be honest, these days it's mostly a thing for tourists who go to Qingdao, they eat it, the locals don't really eat it anymore. If you ordered it for dinner and you ate sort of like mm. three quarters of it and asked for it in a doggy bag, by the time you got home, would you have a full meal again? <laughs> Brilliant. They leave footprints wherever they go, so very bad criminals. Lip prints. Mm. Lip prints, sorry, yes. This was actually an interesting study that I read about on a blog uh, called the Echino blog. It's this guy called Christopher Marr, who calls himself the starfish guy. He's written multiple entries a month on just starfish for 10 years, uh, stopped in 2018. So like literally just hundreds and hundreds of entries just about starfish. And he reported that they don't have suction cups on their feet, which is what everyone always says. Oh. Yeah, right? They right. stick to things by suction. Yes. It's actually more like glue. So they have a fuzzy coat, what's called a fuzzy coat, on each foot. They've got hundreds and hundreds of feet on each leg. So on each foot, they've got a fuzzy coat. And when that touches the ground, they push this kind of gluey film through it, which forms a mesh, and that sticks them to the ground. And then when they lift their leg up again, they leave the fuzzy coat behind. And you can track a starfish across the seafloor if it's shoplifted, because (laughs) they leave these constant, every single one of their little suction things leaves a little fuzzy coat behind. And then you have to take a lip print, which is quite sexy. (laughs) You have an underground group who would do you Botox in your lips, like if you've just done a crime. They'd be able to Like face off. It's like like face off, but just with lips. Lips Lip off. off. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, lips off. Oh, and, and, and is it Travolta and Nicolas Cage? They have to swap lips. (laughs) <laughs> just the lips <laughs> just the lips yeah i think i would watch that film if it was mick jagger and michael gove oh like you yeah. want two people with very different types of lips don't you oh yes. yeah 
And I mean, we are getting into the realm of a body swap comedy here, where Gove has to live as Jagger and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, that, it's weird you say vice versa because um, the body swap comedy genre, uh, which includes what like um, Freaky, Freaky Friday, Friday and all yeah. that stuff, yeah. it began in the 19th century with a book called Vice Versa. Oh, that was the first ever one. It was superb about knowledge. Father and the son who swap places. And the story goes that Anthony Trollope was reading this book out to his friends and he found a bit which was so funny that he just got into a laughing fit and he died. No, no. <laughs> Trollope yeah, died of yeah. laughing? I mean, no, he didn't really. Let's he did. be clear on he that. Did. He, well, died he died. He died of a stroke. Laughing. He died of a stroke, which he had due to intense laughter. And he died a few weeks later, but I think that is true, actually. What? Hold on. He laughed intensely, and then oh, and then he had a stroke immediately, and then yeah, he died yeah. a few weeks later. Sorry, exactly. it wasn't like he had a stroke a few weeks later, and they went. Remember when he laughed a couple of months ago? <laughs> no, no, but no, it was that. That's a better story. Yeah. <laughs> but wow. Yeah. Basically, Freaky Friday killed Anthony Trollope. Wow. Now that's a fact. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everyone. We'd like to let you know that today we're sponsored by BBC Maestro. That's right. BBC Maestro is a subscription-based streaming platform that is created to educate and inspire people and get them to explore their creativity. And they do this by getting some of the leading figures in various industries to give you these incredible courses that span 33 lessons in six hours in some cases uh, from the greatest minds out there. James, this is like my wish list list of heroes i know let me hear some of them down go on okay there's a course on comedy by billy Connolly. i mean what uh, yeah there there is a course on storytelling by alan moore if you know alan moore he wrote the watchmen comics he wrote yeah. from hell he doesn't do much does he he doesn't that's a real coup julia donaldson julia donaldson who writes the greatest kids books in my mind lee child mark ronson it's incredible oh my goodness imagine if you wanted to write a comedy story for children uh which has got <laughs> thriller elements and some amazing remixing music production you would be in your element that was extraordinary that is a bbc maestro in itself right there ladies and gentlemen <laughs> um, and if you want to get involved and see all of these incredible courses all you need to do is head towards bbcmaestro.com and use the offer code fish and you'll get 40% off your favourite video course or 40% off an entire subscription. That's right. So go to BBC Maestro, that's M-A-E-S-T-R-O dot com. Use the offer code FISH and get your 40% off your video course or 40% off a subscription, which gives you access to every single BBC Maestro course. Let the greatest be your teacher with BBC Maestro. And we are also sponsored this week by Babbel. Je m'appelle James Jabita Bolton dans la Nord-Ouest de l'Angleterre. That's about as much as I remember about my GCSE French, but I would love to learn more. So how am I going to do it, Anna? Well, first of all, you're going to stop telling lies like you live in Bolton, when, as far as I can tell, you haven't lived in Bolton for 10 years. Uh, But the way he can become better at French is by signing up to Babbel. So Babbel is the language learning platform, which is the easiest and most efficient and proven to be successful way of learning a new language. Absolutely. If you want to make your next trip abroad a bit more enriching, if you want to maybe expose yourself to better job opportunities, the reason I learn languages is because it's kind of a good workout for the brain. There's all sorts of good reasons for doing Babbel and right now you can get six months for free with a purchase of a six month subscription if you go to Babbel and the way you do that is by going to Babbel B-A-B-B-E-L dot com forward slash play and using the promo code FISH Correct C'est vrai Do go to Babbel B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash play and use the promo code FISH and you'll get an extra six months for free with the purchase of a six month subscription On with the podcast On y va Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that one of the best times for Dracula to suck your blood is while you are watching a Dracula movie. Oh. Mm. Is that because it's so thrilling normally to watch a Dracula movie that you'll be distracted? Or is it because you're watching the Dracula movie, then if you see Dracula in your house... You think, oh, well, that's normal because it's happening on the TV, so it's happening oh, yeah, yeah. here as normal as well. 
We've stumbled into the confusion of the fact immediately, which is, do you mean the best time for Dracula or the best time for you? Because often what's good for a vampire is not good for the person <laughs> the vampire is sucking on. Or oh, is it mutually good for everyone? It's for, no, it's, it's never good for the person being sucked unless they want to become a vampire, <laughs> which often does happen within that world. But uh, it's fantastic the, the for Dracula, world. the fictional world. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic yeah. for Dracula himself because uh, he loves blood. And your blood is at its thickest, or at least it's much thicker when you're watching a vampire movie, a horror movie, anything with scares in it. So Okay, two things. Yeah. Does he like thicker blood? Exactly. Like if your milkshake gets too thick, you can't get it through the straw. <laughs> oh, great mm. point. But if it's too thin, you send back your cup of milk, don't you? That's true. So maybe it's just right. And secondly, you said much thicker. <laughs> It's presumably not so thick it can't get through your veins and arteries. It's like tar. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Okay, yeah. No, it's just a bit thicker. So it's a it's a nice meal for Dracula. This is a, this is a study that was done at Leiden University in the Netherlands, and basically they wanted to analyze blood samples from volunteers who had watched a horror movie, and then at another point watch a very distinctly very unfrightening movie a documentary uh mm -hmm. and so what they did was they found two different movies to show them they found the 2010 horror movie insidious which they showed to them and then a week later they showed them a very as they call it non-alarming documentary called a year in champagne what they found is that the people who sat through insidious had higher levels of the blood clotting protein which is called factor eight did you know that this is pretty unrelated to the subject of this fact but champagne in russia now can only be called champagne if it's made not in champagne if it's made in russia i oh, think so everywhere else we're only allowed to call champagne champagne if it's made in the champagne region it's one of those whereas russia has changed trademark laws so that it can only be if it's russian champagne That's so funny not in america as well you're allowed to call whatever you want champagne in america really yeah because it was Are in you? the decision to um call things champagne that rule was in the treaty of versailles and the americans never ratified the treaty of versailles they had their own treaty against the germans Sorry, right. why what? are there being bolt-ons added to the Treaty of Versailles <laughs> about champagne nomenclature? What I mean, shouldn't we be just focusing on, should we just fix on the war to end wars and bring that safely to a conclusion? I kind no. of feel like we're going quite a long way away from Dan's facts about <laughs> Dracula here. Yeah, fine. But, uh, but yeah, on. basically it was because Germans were making sparkling wine as well. And also the Champagne region had been quite badly hit by the war. Mm. Um, vampires? Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about real vampires for a bit? Yeah, go on. But then mm. proper, like, not real. The real, the people who live in the world as vampires. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I was reading about them, and they, um, they it's really interesting, because basically, most of them don't drink blood. There are a few, the sanguinarians, um, but the, even they are really careful, obviously, because you can get all sorts of diseases from drinking blood. But... Um, I think the vast majority are apparently um, psychic energy drainers who go along to places and feel the energy at places like concerts and then suck the life force yes. from that. Yeah, but yeah. I, we all know people who, when you talk to them, you feel like you're having the life force sucked from you. Mm. And like, I just thought those were boring people, but it turns out they might actually be vampires is that right i think they also um give like massages i think the idea is oh, like do they? if you give someone a massage you can suck up their, their energy from that so rub it out of them wow yeah I think well so. also Reverse. if someone's gonna suck away my psychic energy then i want to be getting something in return for it i guess so a massage seems like a fair deal that is a good deal Re let's take reverse reiki instead of putting your good energy into someone you're you're taking it out oh yeah you know Reiki. Okay. Yeah. I don't uh, really know Reiki. No, not really. Hmm. We've got into some ropey territory here, haven't we? Some non facts based territory. Yeah, yeah, it's pseudoscience, <laughs> but it's quite famous. Hmm. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. But sorry, let's get... get back to vampires and <laughs> sucking <you>. psychic <laughs> energy. <laughs> Yeah, well, you do get fangsmiths as well, people who make prosthetic th fangs for other vampires. Oh, um, really? I, I read an interview with a bloke who's called Father Sebastian. Uh, so it's Sebastian, but with two A's at the end, in the final bit. Um, mm. It's very touching, actually, that he's a fangsmith, because his grandfather was an orthodontist. Oh, really? And so he stayed in the family business, but he's just catering for a slightly more niche audience. Mm. Only makes canines, basically. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Can't do incisors, mate. Sorry. <laughs> you know, real vampires refer to themselves sometimes as hemosexuals, which I find quite funny. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah. quite good. Apart Doesn't that from... imply that you're attracted to blood sexually? Well, and they're very clear that they're not attracted to blood sexually. That's a completely different thing. Well, then um... why do they call themselves hemosexuals? 
it's a funny quip all right it's just a yeah just a i don't chuckle. think they're doing themselves any favors of people thinking they're just <laughs> no. people. so maybe it's a nickname coined from outside the um vamp community i don't know they should focus really on the fact that we are in the minority as blood drinkers in history really because there are just so many instances of people drinking blood oh, yeah. which i suppose i suppose makes sense it was quite available but um and it's always the blood of criminals, it seems to me. And so there's been this belief for thousands of years that blood drinking cured epilepsy. Don't know where that came from, but it's right from ancient Rome. And people would drink the blood of vanquished gladiators or more commonly, they would drink the blood of beheaded criminals. And this ran all the way up to, you know, 1500 years later. Um, in fact, in 1860, there was a source that reported epileptics would still stand around the executioner's block in Alaskan islands with cups in hand, waiting for the blood to spew out. Wow. So that they could Ugh. drink it. To drink. It was always said that um, medically, the blood that was best for curing epilepsy was the blood of criminals which does seem quite convenient that it's also the blood that happens to be likely to flow from the executioner's block. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. true. I read one um, article on this subject which I think made a good point, which is if you see someone bleeding, um, God forbid they're bleeding to death, they're getting mm -hmm. weaker and weaker as they lose the blood. And so it does kind of make logical sense that mm. ingesting blood would make you stronger. And that's probably why people have done it for, for most of history. Right. Yeah. right. Right. So if you see someone dying of loss of blood on the ground, should you hand over your arm and just let them gnaw on it until help comes? No. no. no, no. <laughs> Show them a very, very, very scary film and it will clot fast enough that actually they'll be fine. Oh. Yeah. Or try and maybe put some pressure on the large veins. Maybe Tourniquet. try and That's stop any, the bleeding. Yeah. 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 Anyway, Hopefully there's two of you. So one of you can do the boo and the other one can do the tourniquet. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll just reenact a Dracula film while... Uh... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, one last thing. Vampire bats. So they do. You know how we were talking at the top of this fact about how would Dracula prefer to have thicker blood? Would that not be too thick? So vampire bats have a saliva that contains an enzyme which is called Draculin. And Brilliant. it basically <laughs> prevents blood clotting so that when when it releases this thing, it goes into the bloodstream, which means that the blood can just all flow much quicker. So mm. obviously directly named after Bram Stoker's creation. How did you pronounce it then? Draculin. <laughs> I think it's pronounced Draculin. Ah, 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 <laughs> Sorry, ah. yes. There's a silent ha 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 in the uh, writing here. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and so what they've worked out is if they can take this enzyme, and there's tests that have been going on, there may be new results, but from when I last read it, it was still in the, um, in the research stage. It can be applied to help stroke victims um, by breaking down mm. blood clots. And stroke is an anagram of Stoker. Dun, dun, dun. That well, is... you've really pieced that together. <laughs> I That's... love it. I've got shivers down my spine and I can feel my blood thickening as you speak. It goes all the way to the top. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1554, thousands of people in London were convinced that they heard an angel talking to them from behind a wall and slagging off the Queen. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, is that what an angel would do, though, if That's it came down to That's where angels Earth? hide. That's an angel's <laughs> habitat behind a wall. <laughs> I, I accept the wall thing. I'm just not sure angels are going to bother to make the journey down to Earth to slag off the Queen. Well, if the Queen was Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, who was doing terrible mm. things in the name of religion, then you mm -hmm. might do. I don't know. No, maybe you would as an angel. So, yeah, that's, um, spoiler alert, the Queen that I'm referring to, Bloody Mary, who was on the throne at the time. Obviously, lots of upheaval in Europe about um, uh, Protestantism and Catholicism and stuff like that. Um, the Queen was about to marry Philip II, I think, of Spain. Yeah. Uh, and there were lots of people in England who weren't very happy about this because he was a big old Catholic. And so they tried to do whatever they could to stop it. One of the things would be to rouse up the rabble. And one of the ways that they thought to do this was to pretend that there was an angel in a wall. And the angel in question was a woman called Elizabeth Crofts. Uh, who, according to the 
Dictionary of National Biography, nothing is known of her before 1554, and nothing was heard of her after 1554. She just comes into <laughs> history, does this amazing thing, and then disappears again. It's incredible. Yeah. Angels have got a lot on, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. I read a blog by a um, history writer called Susan Abernethy, and she was saying that they believe she might have been uh, born in 1535 because there's details written that she was of a certain age, and so they've just pieced it back that way. Uh, they believe mm-hmm. that she was working in a house at the time as a maid, and so she was put behind this wall. She was given a whistle so that she could make weird whistling noises, um, nice. and then she also began to speak sort of anti-Catholic propaganda and um, people started calling her the angel or a bird that was in the wall. So it's, it could have been a bird is the other option, by the way. Um, Still crazy if a bird is saying stuff that's um, exactly. about the Queen's yeah. forthcoming mm-hmm. marriage. That's I would still stop on the street and listen to that. Yeah. And they hid people in the crowd. Unless it saying, was a parrot, Andy. It was going, ah, parrot, ah. Yeah, that... That's interesting. I'm sort of now wondering what I would stop on the street for. As in, if a parrot was doing quite convincing sectarian propaganda, mm. I would probably, I would probably pause. Yeah. But what if you, even if you're in a rush, you're five minutes late for the podcast already. We're gonna have no sympathy if it's oh, I stopped on the street because there's a parrot giving anti-Catholic propaganda. Yeah. Um. If I was in a rush, I'd probably just sort of hope it would still be there when I came back mm, yeah the other way which I think she was wasn't she Elizabeth Cross and she st- she had to be stuck in I think she was in the wall sort yeah. of it's kind of a hit it was like a, she was hidden inside the wall it was, it was a like a wall. facade wall yeah that was put out in front of the main wall I think and she was sort of in between and it, it lasted Damn. days so yeah did she sleep there did she go home was there a door in the other wall that she could go through I, you know <laughs> there must have been a way of getting so her many out questions. yeah I think the point though Anna is that it's saying it's a bird or an angel that would be the debate. Andy would be going by and, and he would just have an opinion going, what's well, obviously a parrot? And they're saying, well, no, we think it might be an angel. You know, there's, there's mystery oh, there. I see. Mm. I see. There was a pick up uproar in the end and they oh, went yeah. to the mayor of London and the mayor of London said, well, why don't we just knock down the wall and see whether it's a bird or an angel or what? <laughs> and they knocked down the wall and sure enough, it was this, um, this woman, a woman, Elizabeth Crofts. <laughs> this just reminds me so much of when I'd hand essays in late and I just wouldn't have a plan for when the teacher said, where's your essay? It's like, surely the people who know that there's a girl behind the wall are watching <laughs> the demolition men knocking brick after brick and thinking, how are we going to deal with this? They should, how we- yeah. they should have why put didn't her, they get rid of her? They should have put her in like either an angel or a parrot costume. Yeah. Yes. yeah, exactly. Yes. Or a brick costume. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Oh, no, but Just that's dangerous. Camouflage. That's dangerous if someone no, you're comes right, in that with is a dangerous. sledgehammer hitting bricks. <laughs> you don't want to be dressed as a But she could just say, I'm a talking brick. I'm a magical talking brick. <laughs> yeah. Who's got strong opinions about the Queen's religious faith. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You fine. wouldn't dare um, destroy that, would you? No. I think, should we just say sort of quickly the context? Like, what, like, why is all, I mean, James, you've already said a bit of it, but basically, England had been through a right old nightmare in the previous decades where, you know, England was Catholic and then Henry VIII, Mary's dad, uh, broke with the church and dissolved the monasteries and then his son, Edward VI, took England even further away from the Catholic church and then he died aged about 16 and then Mary, his half sister, became queen yeah. and and then and she was very catholic you know so dragged yeah. it back i mean poor old edward who always gets accused of introducing a very protestant regime and the guy was nine i mean there were just lots of old men behind him <laughs> saying say <laughs> no, this now really edward, say yeah. that and the wall was um, very pro queen elizabeth the future queen the elizabeth wall. the wall yeah the angel oh, yeah, yeah, the bird yeah. in mm-hmm. the wall um because yeah, yeah. they would cry out things like you know god save queen mary and the wall would stay silent and then they'd say god oh. save lady the Elizabeth and the wall would say so be it so they really wanted her to get in to power yeah. because she would have kept it Protestant according to what they believed at the time yeah you know that um Pink Floyd song brick in the wall is actually based on this incident in 1554 <laughs> yeah. yes. you know you're just another brick in the wall is addressed to Elizabeth Croft <laughs> um, and then what happened was um because she was uh, just a maid uh, who don't need no education um, <laughs> she was <laughs> <laughs> she was let go, basically. They decided that she must have been... Um, sh- there must have been other people behind it and must have been other people who talked her into it and probably she was just a pawn in their scheme. And they let her go. She, I think she was in prison for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And then, was, yeah. She, was she doing it for any money? Uh, which is, of course, another very famous Pink, Pink Floyd song. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. I hope she didn't suffer any brain damage as a result of uh, the wall being broken in on. Is that another yes. one? It is. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. is, yeah. Right. Yeah, anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I always think it must be so awkward in the Tudor era when 
as you say, there was um, Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, obviously, and who was Protestant. And then there was Mary, who was very Catholic. And then there was Edward, who was Protestant. But they all hung out together as well. I mean, Mary was essentially sent away from the royal household when Henry um, divorced Catherine of Aragon. But then she was sort of brought back in, a bit of a disgrace because she was Catholic, but brought back in. She's hanging out with Elizabeth. But at the same time, they both know that they're on opposite sides. Um, they also, Elizabeth also lived with Lady Jane Grey, which I didn't realise, which for mm. international listeners is a famous here as the nine day queen. And she, she's the Liz Truss of the monarchy, isn't she? <laughs> she oh <laughs> famous is such a generous way of putting it, Anna. I mean, Lady Jane Grey is not a, we're not all going around talking about Lady Jane Grey today. It's, she's, she's pretty She's a obscure. huge celeb. She's, it's Lady Jane Grey and the Kardashians are very much forefront mm. of everyone's mind. Um, no, okay, maybe she's famous in like year 10 history classes. So basically she was the <laughs> Protestant who Edward and the people behind Edward wanted on the throne. Right. And then Mary had her executed. Yeah. And then Mary had her Which executed. was kind of par for the course because you've got to have the people who are claimants to the throne, you know, like blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, I, th- I do, in- like Mary, uh, Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, has a really, really bad reputation. And I think a lot of it is a deeply inherited propaganda, as in you're just kind of... Yeah. You assume that oh, just that she was the awkward, awful bit before Queen Elizabeth came in and sorted it all out. But her teenage years were really. Um, I just think of how embarrassed you are as a teenager. And basically, firstly, your parents break up. Okay, then your dad changes the entire religious structure of the country so that he can remarry. That must be tough. At and school. then, and- exactly, and then he annuls his marriage to your mum. So suddenly. Your parents were never married, so now she's illegitimate. Yeah. And you're downgraded from a princess to a lady. So, I mean... Yeah, but she's like, that, she's always... It must have been very embarrassing. Oh, but yeah. whenever she's whinging about that, she's always got little sister Elizabeth there putting her hand up going, uh, mate, our dad killed my mum. Yeah. Chopped her head off. So yeah, keep your mouth true. shut, love. But, but I read that she had to then become part of the sort of servant crew for Elizabeth. So she didn't even just get yeah. demoted. She was actively oh, then sort of like, here's your breakfast. Your little sister. Here's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, harsh. It is funny that she's remembered as Bloody Mary still now, even though that is anti-Catholic propaganda, really. Or it's the fact that Protestantism or the Church of England won over. And also there was that that very famous book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, that was... I mean, it's hard to underestimate how popular this book was. It was published in 1563, so shortly after Mary had died. And it was basically the book of all the great Christian martyrs who had died for their faith throughout time. And it ended with all of Mary's martyrs. So she killed about 260 people, I think, burned at the stake. And so this was a great piece of propaganda against Mary. But it sold like 150 million copies. What? No, hang, Come on, no hang on. Oh, no, no, over, that's greater than the world's population. It was over. For many hundreds of years. So oh, for but, about 300 but, years, it was the best-selling book alongside the Bible. And it was so gory. I mean, yeah. there's there's got to be a reason it was so popular. And I think it was the amazing detail of how these people died. Like Anne Askew. Do you know Anne Askew? Was she called Anne Askew before she died? Or did the Askew <laughs> bit come after whatever <laughs> happened to her? <laughs> she was the first English woman ever to demand a divorce because Ooh. she was Protestant, her husband was Catholic, she didn't like that. And she refused to accept transubstantiation, so refused to believe that mm. um, the bread was the body mm. of Christ. And we should say, of all these people, I think if they'd recanted, they wouldn't have been burned. Oh, yeah, it's their didn't. fault. Oh, take their so- <laughs> yeah, take the side <laughs> of Bloody Mary. Go on, die, don't you? <laughs> Let's show a bit of balance. Um, she was put on the rack and stretched, which is always nice when you hear about one of these really um, sort of... A torture instruments you learn about at primary school being used and she was stretched and all of her limbs were dislocated so that will make you askew i mean <laughs> she was sent right askew yeah fitting Ooh, wow. um and then she was Good executed story. and she had to be carried to the stake on a chair um because she couldn't walk understandably i imagine Gosh. sort of flopping over this chair lovely yeah so it's that kind of stuff you can see why it's a bestseller yeah i think another i mean obviously the 200 years of 
propaganda and England defining itself specifically as being a non-Catholic country w- will have played into it. But I think another thing was that the burning at the... St- like Elizabeth had loads of people executed. Yeah, She had loads mm. of religious heretics executed as well, but she tended to execute them as traitors instead of heretics. So it was seen as more of a, a political thing, or it's easier to write off as a political decision rather than Bloody Mary, the religious... You know, religious yeah. um, I mean, Henry VIII, yeah. like, yeah. what, 60,000 probably... Compared God, yeah. to a few hundred for Bloody Mary. But yeah, yeah, they're just like, oh, well, they weren't birds at the stake. It wasn't heresy. So, yeah, yeah. I was trying to think if, because yeah. um, I knew nothing about Mary and uh, the Bloody Mary name. Is that where we get the name for the drink? I, I sort of had Must a quick be. look into that. Well, no, there's no idea. lots of theories about what it could be. Um, Bloody Mary is obviously one of them. She's included in there. There's a thought that it might be the Hollywood star Mary Pickford. Um, but one of the main ones is that, and this is there's quite a famous bar called Harry's New York Bar, uh, which, I, you know, weirdly is in Paris. Um, but uh, <laughs> according to their manager... I'd run by a guy called Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, according to their manager, there used to be a cocktail waitress called Mary who used to uh, work in a Chicago bar called the Bucket of Blood and um, ah. supposedly it was that right. yeah that's so cool. there's, I mean, we don't know yeah probably after that rather than the really famous historical figure who was just called <laughs> Bloody Mary <laughs> it is amazing all those cocktails because they're all within memory of people you know they're all within a couple of generations but almost every cocktail the name is lost to the mists of time isn't it mm. It's because everyone's pissed, aren't they? As soon as they've invented it. <laughs> no one can mm. remember what, how it happened. I was looking up the sort of propaganda of the time. Oh, yeah. And mm. um, it was the big age of the pamphlet. Um, oh, yeah. I kind of hope it comes back one day, the pamphlet. Yeah. Because it's a right old ass writing a book. <laughs> have you, <laughs> have you tried recently, James? Oh, yeah, I have, actually. Um, Anna and I, in fact, wrote uh, Everything to Play for, the QI book of sports, but, you know, far be huh. it from me I to just wrote that. a pamphlet version, which I think you incorporated <laughs> into your larger book. But, yeah, it's basically there was such good propaganda, pamphlets. I don't mean your book. I'm sure your book is scrupulously even-handed. Um, <laughs> but, and, you know, you can print them in a couple of days, you can distribute them fast and cheap, and it was like people having substacks today. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I found a, this is slightly later. This is a later anti-Catholic document from 1624 called The Travels of Time, right? And it was printed, again, as a sort of regal monarchy commentary. So Charles I, who was seen as being quite pro-Catholic, um, was uh, going to marry the Spanish Infanta, oh, yeah. uh, which was a princess, not an infant. I, I mean, given the time, she might also have been like eight, but I don't I know. Mean- um, but the marriage collapsed, oh. and people printed. I find this so... Like, it's, again, it's quite... Um, it's quite gossipy but they just printed these pamphlets to celebrate the collapse of the marriage the prospective marriage between the two of them and again if people were doing that about me I'd be heard but there were all these allegorical images that was a huge thing and people got all the allegories in these pamphlets so one of the images in this pamphlet showed the Spanish ambassador to England Don Diego Samiento de Acuma Gondomar using his buttocks to incubate locust eggs (laughs) and that was an acceptable political point to make at the that time quite good though. <laughs> what's the political hold on, what do the locust eggs represent is that i think they might spawn represent of the devil pa- or pa- papacy pa- pope popism you know that kind of stuff um, and it was incredibly rude this is quite an obscure historical paper i found this in because he was and i'm quoting here the renowned sufferer of an anal fistula uh, so it was especially uh, funny to show him good. with locust eggs in his bum ouch that's i know that's tough on what him. a terrible yeah. part of your bio that gets used for like chat shows <laughs> famous sufferer <laughs> of anal fistula <laughs> <laughs> he prefers to talk about anglo-spanish diplomacy but of course we know him as mr fistula <laughs> welcome to the stage <laughs> mr fistula does sound like quite a good music hall name for someone doesn't it, it? Does. <laughs> yeah uh until 1910 when you became king or queen you had to swear that you repudiated catholicism as superstitious and idolatrous huh. isn't that amazing until the 20th century you had to do that and then edward the seventh said Edward the Seventh did do it, but he insisted on whispering the words because he thought it'd be an insult <laughs> to any Catholics who were living in the country at the time. And that sounded like it was, yeah. yeah. Who were happened. famously hard of hearing, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is Anna. 
My fact this week is that this year, a woman was injured when she was attacked twice. Once by a five foot long snake that fell from the sky, then immediately afterwards by the hawk that dropped it. <laughs> this was really some idle maternity leave reading actually I think I read it in the week it's just the most incredible story it's a woman called Peggy Jones in Texas who was mowing her lawn and a large snake fell out of the sky her husband estimated later that it was 4.5 feet long which is large and it mm. wrapped itself around her arm like I'm kind of imagining you you know those things that you used to slap your arm with as a kid and they oh, yeah. wrapped oh, around yeah. them they'd wrap around yeah yeah mm. I'm sort of imagining it did that as it fell and she tried to shake it off and it got tighter and tighter and the hawk that had been carrying the snake in its mouth plunged down and started attacking her to try and get the snake back and they both managed to inflict multiple injuries so the hawk was flying at her and grabbing for the snake and slapping her with its oh. wings and clawed these deep cuts in her arm and the snake meanwhile was striking her in the face and chipping her glasses and apparently spewing a liquid yeah uh, and i love her husband wendell <laughs> got to her by riding over on his mower yeah imagine Just, her. oh wow hurry up wendell go into fifth gear <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what a scene so this is um she's one of the first people to have been involved in a a, a snake and bird incident since just two years ago, when Dwayne The Rock Johnson no. was, I mean, it was a minor celebrity story. He was temporarily barricaded in his home because there was a snake right outside his front door, which was busy being eaten by a large hawk, which was busy eating the snake. Oh, okay. And whenever he kind of got near it, it, it was threatening and flapping at him. Wow. And, you know, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Minor celebrity. Probably one of no, the highest sorry, paid sorry, actors sorry, on sorry, earth. No, 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 sorry, I don't mean to call him a minor. I mean, the story is a minor story about a major celebrity, but I think we can all agree it's not one of the main things in his life. This <laughs> yeah. story. Sorry. Wow. I, no, look, what, I'm a huge supporter of him and his work. I just don't want to smell what he's cooking. And um, <laughs> I'm very happy to, to say he's a big deal. You know, he's in Jumanji, for heaven's sake. The new one, not the original. Um, um, the new but, one, by the way, which has a body swap part in it, which reminds me of an old book called oh. Vice Versa. <laughs> <laughs> um, animal attacks, they happen way more than I realised. As in, if you just do a new search, there are multiple stories globally that are just pumped out every single day. So just 24 hours ago, when I was you know, looking at these facts, um, an Australian farmer... He described himself uh, to the BBC and other outlets as lucky to be alive after repelling a crocodile by biting the crocodile back. So he found his face leaning against the crocodile's head and he bit the mm. eyelid of the crocodile, making Ooh. the crocodile freak out. It let go of its bite and he was able to escape. But it was only by biting the crocodile back that, that he was able to get out there. Um, so many news articles. Look, this is literally the last three days. Arizona woman fatally trampled by elk. She might have been trying to feed. Porn star's pet python bites partner's penis and horror scene. Blood <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the animal world is famously dangerous, Dan. Um, but on things that you don't expect to attack you... Mm. I think of otters. Well, otters, I think, are the cutest animals alive. And so I was very surprised about an otter attack on someone called Leah Hillier. This was a few years ago, and it's really incredible. It was in Minnesota on this remote lake, and she always went for a swim in the lake. She was staying at her, grand, uh, her dad's lake house with her kids, always went for a swim in the lake. She swam a mile a day, felt one day something bite her leg. And then about 20 feet away, really quickly, an otter bobbed its head up and then it kept swimming back to her leg and biting her leg again and then swimming away and then bobbing its head up and looking at her. And it bit her 25 times <laughs> and like properly, it, it pierced her ankle bone, it pierced through her calf muscle. She's an otter and she yeah. was screaming for help and her dad, her poor dad, heard these screams and tried to start the motorboat to get to her and in his panic he flooded the engine of the motorboat. Oh no. And he also had to get the kids, she had two kids who were two and four, so he had to get the kids on the boat. So he got another boat started, got out to her, dragged these poor kids' blood-drenched mother out of the water. And yeah. the maddest thing for me is she got out of the water, got to hospital, was given a rabies shot in every single one of the 25 bites, uh, okay. which made her vomit. Two weeks later, she got back in the lake. Matt, oh, nice. The yeah. otter's still in it. 
The otter's just there, bobbing oh. away. Would you? I feel like I wouldn't go swimming again. That's ballsy. Yeah. You see a few otter stories of them attacking people. There was um, a minor celebrity story, and I actually will say this is about a minor celebrity, <laughs> uh, an actor called Crystal Finn, who was in Succession. Uh, but okay. one, one of the quite minor characters in Succession. I'm sure she's an amazing actor, but I'd never heard of her before. Yeah. Uh, she got bitten on her backside and on her leg this year by otters. Uh, there was a guy called Graham George Spencer who was bitten 26 times in 10 seconds Whoa. by otters. Isn't no. that amazing? Was that yeah. multiple otters? It was a it was a pack of otters, yeah. Uh, I don't know what the yeah. record is yeah. for the world's fastest jewel, but that would be up there. <laughs> um, his friend ran over screaming to try and scare off the otters and they mm. sort of, they, they swam away. But then the pair said they ran towards the visitor centre to get help, still pursued by the otters. Oh, no. <laughs> Exit pursued by an otter. <laughs> amazing? Um, I was reading an article about why animals don't attack us more than they already do. Okay. And obviously, most of the time, when, hu- when animals attack humans, it's because we're in their space or because they're protecting their n- young nearby or because we're on their territory, you know. Um, but uh, because we're bipedal, we look bigger. We, d- we don't look bigger than we are, but you know what I mean? We look bigger than we would if we were on all fours. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit of a bluff. It makes us yeah. look a bit tougher. And also, uh, it does mean we're slower. You can't outrun a cat. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of maybe perceived as a bit of a... A show of strength. Like, I don't need to be able to outrun a cat because I'm so tough. That's risky, so, isn't it? It is. Ri- I don't know if that's... Is it's that not why, why I do it. your, um, your <laughs> MMA career is going so well, Andy? Because you're like, I'm so good at MMA. I don't even have to work out. I don't have to get buff. I don't have to be strong looking. <laughs> yeah. No one has ever turned up to a fight with me in the MMA ring because they're so terrified of this <laughs> quite average looking bloke who seems to have done no exercise. Yeah. I'm always really sceptical about the old uh, make yourself look bigger by putting your arms out. And I guess it must be true because it does work. But it is like, are bears blind? Can they not see that once we put our arms out, it's just two s- small spindly things sticking yeah. out of us? Why do they suddenly go, oh my God, he's absolutely massive. I've never noticed before. <laughs> If you're bipedal, you're bigger looking to something that's looking at you from the side. But <laughs> yeah. like worms probably think we're smaller than we are. <laughs> because <laughs> from a worm's eye view, if we were on our all fours, we'd be much bigger. Yeah. Mm. And hawks, actually. Maybe this one was attacked yeah. by a hawk because... That's true. Uh-huh. I should have gone for hawks, actually. Yeah. Rather than worms. Yeah. No, I like worms. I think that's good. That's why you get so many um, worm attacks. <laughs> <laughs> they cover them up you do we just wouldn't know worms are attacking us all the time we've yeah. just got no idea <laughs> just headbutting us from below um, yeah. the hitchcock film the worms was a complete commercial <laughs> and critical flop wasn't it um you know um uh Aeschylus. so we mentioned yeah. before ancient greek playwright who was killed when a bird dropped a tortoise on his head oh and yeah i thought the idea was that the that hawks drop turtles on rocks to open them up so they can eat the delicious turtle inside. Mm-hmm. And they thought his head was a rock because he was yeah. so bold. That was that the claim. Is, that is the claim, yeah. Um, so I just sort of looked him up because I don't think we mentioned anything really more about him at the time, just he was an ancient mm. Greek playwright. And so I found out um, this about him. There is a theory that he invented people talking to each other on stage. <laughs> So oh. he, he was a pretty early dramatist, and this is claimed by Aristotle. So you know, pinch of salt, and some earlier sources would have been lost. Blah blah blah. But Aristotle claims that basically he invented characters who had conflict between each other, and before that, characters could only speak to the chorus, and everyone was speaking to the chorus and not right. to each other on stage. What Isn't an innovation! That, like, what a moment! Yeah, yeah. that yeah. must have been and huge. Imagine, and if he hadn't come up with that, we would still all have to be talking. Just to the everything chorus. would be to the chorus. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's so weird to have invented the chorus element first, though, right? Because it seems less obvious. Because <laughs> in normal life, it's not like when I chat to someone, it's always mediated by a group of 12 people singing annoying songs. I just do it direct. It's quite odd, isn't well, it? No, but then maybe that's what separated it as fantasy from real life. You know, Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference, maybe. He's, he's like Ricky Gervais inventing The Office. Suddenly, sitcom is just... <laughs> Aeschylus, the Ricky Gervais of his time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, just back to um, snakes that uh, have been attacking people. Um, mm. I read a story about a guy who's called Valentin Grimaldo uh, from Texas. A coral snake came up and bit him on his hand. He grabbed the snake, he bit its head off, and then used the snake as a band 
around his arm to Stop cut it. off. No. Yeah. Like a, what they call the tourniquet. Tourniquet. Yeah. 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 He used that around his arm and then they went off to the hospital's emergency room and he was fine. He still got the head as a keepsake. Wow. That's that, really ignominious that's wild. for a snake, isn't it? How embarrassing. You know dragons? Sure. Not yeah. real. Um, there is a theory, and I think it is a true theory, that basically dragons are just sexed up snakes. To what extent um, is it true theory, sorry? I think it's true. <laughs> I think when you look at like people writing about dragons, especially in the Middle Ages, mm. they start off being these worm-like creatures with no legs that have stripes on their body and forked tongues. Mm -hmm. And then as the Middle Ages progresses to the Renaissance, they just become more and more fantastical that they can fly and breathe fire and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so what we reckon is because the kind of story started off in um, the Southern Europe and um, Egypt and whatever, where there were plenty of snakes, it, and then they came up into Europe where there weren't so many snakes. People just started adding stuff because they didn't know what snakes were like, really. In the Iliad, the original or the earliest version of the Iliad that we have, um, it says that the dragon could be eaten by eagles, which obviously oh, wow. the modern day dragon, you would not be possibly to do that. But No. Th bizarrely, on an earlier fact, I had to think about the Odyssey, which I didn't say, which oh, is yeah. that the Odyssey features the first appearance in literature of black pudding. Oh, does it? Does and it, really? it was about eat people eating blood. I think that was why I was on that tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they say it's a sort of goaty blood sausage that they have, and it is clearly a black pudding. Oh, and that's wow. in the Odyssey. What's the bigger yeah. innovation, do you think, Andy? The introduction of black pudding or chatting to each other on stage? Interesting. Gosh, they're both massive, aren't they? <laughs> they're both huge deals, but in different, such different spheres of endeavour. Mm, mm. I, I reckon think... most people on Earth could say they could live without one. Um... I could live without black pudding. <laughs> That's the one I think Anna was. I yeah. think, but I, I think we. I no, no, no. I think, I think some people would say they could live without drama, but not black pudding. You know, I'm sure there are people in the people in the north who are like, I could, <laughs> yeah. I could. yeah, say it, Anna. People in the north. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually I was going to go as far as Scotland, in fact, in my stereotyping. Do we still get Coronation Street? And uh, black pudding. Can we say that at least? You can yeah. get Coronation Street, but everything is mediated through the character of Elsie Tanner, who plays the okay. chorus. Yeah. Speaking of snakes, have you guys ever seen, and I address this mainly to Dan, a documentary on the Discovery Channel in 2014 called Eaten Alive? Mm, is this where the guy um, decided to be eaten uh, by a snake I knew and ingested? Yeah. Well, because he went in the wrong way, I think, is the story. He went in head first. He went yeah. in through Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> he didn't crawl up the snake's ass. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I've got it the wrong way, guys. <laughs> it's such a mad, stupid thing to do. And um, Paul Rosalie was his name. <laughs> And he, first of all, he was on an expedition in the Amazon to find the biggest anaconda there was, a biggest green anaconda there was. Yeah, that he'd cool. heard tell it existed. It would be over 24 feet long. It'd be the world's mm. longest. And once he got there, he was going to let it eat him. And this... Was the idea that he was in a sleeping bag or something or that he was in some kind of sack which he could then wriggle out of? He wore a special suit so he could survive yeah. it and then he was <laughs> going to be extracted from the <laughs> So snake. he wouldn't be digested, yeah. Did he, did he go into the... Uh, he totally screwed up. So first of all, he didn't find the big anaconda. So he had to be supplied with a 20-foot one from a zoo. Um, then he, he had this suit which they drenched in pig's blood to make the snake want to eat him. Yeah, and he said he saw the snake's mouth open, everything went black. I think his head went into the snake. His shoulders maybe went into the snake. What about, what about his knees and toes? <laughs> <laughs> and then he was a starfish, so it became very confusing. That is going to be a real... When I listen back to that edit and see which of us got in first with that one. <laughs> yeah. It was a, a photo real... finish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so wait, sorry. His head went into the snake and everything went black. How mysterious. <laughs> yeah. Like, so then, yeah, then what? I mean, I, th well, I think then, he, yeah. he tapped out. He, the snake started twisting his body and started wrenching his arm around a bit. And he suddenly thought, oh, this hurts. My arm's hurting. Yeah. And started shouting to the, the technical assistants, can you get me out now, please? And he so wasn't on his own. So he was shouting from inside the snake, get me out. I'm done. And so yeah. they, they managed to extract him from the snake. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Did he shout, I'm a minor celebrity, get me out of here? <laughs> <laughs> it's not The Rock. <laughs> He said it was all to raise awareness about the plight of wildlife in the Amazon, about yeah. which there's some scepticism from me. 
Well, he, we, he just has, because now we've no, he sent hasn't. the message. No one's coming away from this podcast thinking, oh, the plight of animals in the Amazon. That's what I've remembered. <laughs> They're thinking, idiot shoved his head in a snake. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, James. At James Harkin. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. And Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. Yep, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of the previous episodes are up there, so do check them out. Bit of a merch store up there as well, and also a link to Club Fish, the secret behind the scenes club that we have created where there's lots of bonus episodes, a big old place where the fans get together called Discord. Uh, it's a great place. Check it out. Uh, but otherwise, just come back here next week because we'll be back with another episode, and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.